Now you're going to hate this at first, but ho hold on for a moment. We learn the contact other plane spell. Now, ho hold on, hold on, hold on. We can cast it once per day for free to talk to our patron. Okay. And we automatically succeed on the saving throw of the spell. Is, is this the one that if you fail, it makes you go insane? Yes. Okay. But don't worry, that won't happen to us. Right. We're fine. Hello, friends. Robert Pepin here, author of the Caverns and Creatures series of comedy, fantasy novels, and short stories. With me is Cameron, a.k.a. Prince Phantom. And today we are going to cover the um, the new revised Warlock for 2024. Yep, my favorite class, and one that's been heavily featured on this channel with a long-running yeah. series of Warlock Wednesdays that might have to make a comeback. We'll see. Um, yeah, that, there's a lot to go over. Interesting. Uh, Warlocks, so it's interesting. I'll give you a bit of history because I know you didn't really keep up with the playtest as it was going on. The Warlock had a very tumultuous path through the playtest. Uh, it had a brief stint as a half-caster, um, <laughs> which nobody liked, for good reason. Um, and uh, so they axed that, which means that the base Warlock class, literally just the class level by level, hasn't actually changed all that much. What has changed, though, is everything around it, drastically. Invocations have changed, subclasses have changed, spells have changed. There's a lot going on here. So we won't have to spend too much time on the base class itself, but there's a lot of other stuff we got to talk about. Okay. <clears throat> and I, I will say, I'm mostly happy with just about all of it. So yay. <laughs> uh, so, real quick, let's get into the base class, because we're going to immediately Wait. have to jump into one of our side tangents. Go ahead. Before we do that, what do you feel were the weaknesses that should have been addressed with the warlock right so obviously the biggest one is spell slots right yes that is something that they that, that's something that they claim they tried to address with the whole half caster system it didn't work um yeah so i, I, I don't i don't like the half caster the, any of the ones that already exist no it's it's the hat when you, whenever you're a half caster, your spells are a complement to your martial prowess normally. Yes, but you're and always the warlock getting... isn't supposed to be a mar martial prowess. Yeah, and you're also getting like spells that would have been okay, like eight levels too late. Yeah, so that they didn't go with that. Our actual spell progression in terms of the slots and the levels when we gave them, when we gave them all that stuff hasn't changed at all. Personally, I would have liked to see some better scaling. Uh, I would have liked to see it maybe scale up instead of to four total pack slots by level 20, maybe up to six. And mm. maybe somewhere between level two and nine, which is the stretch you go from for only having two spell slots. Um, I would have liked to see maybe an increase to three, and then by level nine, an increase to four, and then by level 13, an increase to five, and then level 17, an increase to six. I think that would have been a nice change. They didn't yeah, do that. Too. Instead, we Stingy do have, uh, yeah, um, we do have a feature that helps us restore spell slots more quickly. Obviously, we can always record rec recover them on a short rest, just as before. Um, but we'll get to that. I believe that is level two. Uh, yes, that is level two feature. So we'll get to that in just a little bit. So the besides that, in terms of weaknesses. Um, I suppose low AC, but that is very easily fixed in previous, and it is still very easily fixed. Now, I'm going to go over a couple of ways to do that, because um, it's not quite as... There's, it's just as easy, but the ways are different. So, okay. <clears throat> in terms of level one, the proficiencies, there's no major changes here. Don't worry about that. For packed magic, like I said, surprisingly, no changes. Um, additionally, in terms of extra spells that the Warlock got, very few outside of what Tasha's had already provided them. There was a big claim that all the spellcaster spell lists were getting expanded by a lot. <laughs> the more I'm researching this, the more that I'm finding out to not be true at all. Um, at least if you don't count, you know, stuff that was already added from Tasha's. Right. So there are a couple of small ones, but nothing that I really felt men mentioned noting. So spell revisions that are kind of worth noting, though. True Strike, specifically for the melee uh, warlocks, uh, which we're going to talk about that is 
quite helpful for them for the early levels when they're only making one attack anyway. Um, additionally, uh, not Shadow of Moyle, um, Hunger of Hadar, that's it. The third level one that creates an area that right. deals damage and blinds people. Uh, now it upcasts, whereas before it didn't. Oh, well, so, that's handy. Yeah, it actually has utility. It used to be you'd use it for levels 5 and 6 and then move on to something else past that because it wasn't upcasting. Now you can use it past that, and so that's nice. Um, some other notable changes. Um, Force Cage, which I believe was a 7th level Mystic Arcanum option, uh, got nerfed to the ground. It requires concentration now, which basically means just use Wall of Force. Um, there's a couple of other small changes, but pretty much the spells that you were using before you can keep using them. Um, notably, too, Eldritch Blast still does what it always did. Pretty much the same. Uh, there were no real changes to the spell or to the invocations that interact with it. The only big one I could find is that Repelling Blast only works on large or smaller creatures, whereas before it had no size restriction. Um, now... I did. I did take a look through the invocations. Were all the invocation, like all the invocations from Five E, were not included in uh, the revision? Was it? Were they? That is correct. You will notice this is a smaller list of invocations. Yes. Than what we have had now. Notably, now, how does that work with backward compatibility? Is this, or is this the official list we're supposed to be able to pull from now, or based on everything else in the book? This is just the revisions of these named okay. Eldritch Invocations. You may still take Eldritch Invocations from previous books as long as they are not the same name as these. Right. So... Uh, some... Because I noticed some um, exceptions were a lot of the ones that interact with, Agon uh, with uh, Eldritch Blast that I thought should get revi revised a bit. Um, for example, the... Uh, the Lance of Lethargy and um Yes. The the, the other one that pulls. The one huh? The one that pulls. Yes. Like you know, they should have been uh updated to like repelling blast where they you know work for every blast rather than every uh however they work. Once per turn. Once per turn. Yeah, and that didn't happen. That sucks. Yeah, so that uh, that's confusing to me as well. I don't think Either of those invocations would have been overpowered to do that with. I mean, maybe Lance of Lethargy, reducing 10 foot, you know, say you've got three beams, reducing somebody's speed by 30 foot might completely immobilize them. Yeah. There's a lot of ways to do that in this game anyway. I don't think that's very overpowered. And it requires you hitting three attack rolls all in a row. I, I think it would have been fine, honestly. Yeah, and if you immobilize one table, guy or slow down three guys. That's yeah. Yeah, it, and if that's what, how you want to play it as your table, I don't think you have any problems in terms of power balance with that. Yeah. So, um, so let's go over the invocations while we're still talking about them, okay. because now you get them at level one rather than level two. Um, and in fact, you will get more invocations as you level up. There's a reason for that. We'll get into that here in a second. So here's the rate in which you get them. You get one at level one, three at level two. So that's a big jump. <laughs> three. All right. Nice. Yep. Uh, then at level 5, you'll have 5, and at level 7, you'll have 6, at level 9, you'll have 7, at level 12, you'll have 8, and at level 15, you'll have 9, and at level 18, you'll have 10. So previous Warlocks, I believe, capped at 9. You're now capping at 10, so you're getting an okay. extra one. Nice. Um, so I'm not going to go over every single invocation change, but I'll just hit a lot of the highlights that most Warlocks are going to care about. Um, so the first three that I want to talk about are interesting. These are the Pact Boons. They are now invocations. They are not class features. Oh, anymore. all right. This means you have to take them. You have to select them with one of your invocation slots, um, which is one of the reasons why you're getting more now. Right. Now, that being said, this also means that you can get multiple of them if you'd like. Hmm. Whereas previously you couldn't. You were locked into one. It also means, because you can swap invocations out, you can change them. So if you get to a level and you say, uh, Pack to the Tome's not doing much for me anymore, I'll swap it for Pack to the Chain. You can do that. Hmm. So, there's a lot more flexibility now. 
So let's go over the three of them. Uh, I'll start off with the simplest one, Pact of the Tome. You can use the book as a spellcasting focus now. You get, and when you take the invocation, you get two level one rituals along with the three cantrips that you got previously. Now, notably, in this book, there is no Book of Ancient Secrets invocation. So if you play just by this book and you don't use backwards compatibility, those two rituals that you got are the only ones you're getting. Now, that being said, backwards compatibility exists. So uh, you can take Book of Ancient Secrets and gain more uh, ritual spells. Um, and I will also mention that you can change the spells that are in the book, both the ritual spells and the cantrips, each day by just creating a new book. Oh, all right. So I think this if we just compare this straight to Pact of the Tome, this is a straight upgrade. You're getting two rituals where you didn't before. Um, if you're not allowing Book of Ancient Secrets, this is a major nerf. If you are allowing Book of Ancient Secrets, it's a buff. That's how important that invocation is to this pact. Right, yeah. So, uh, Pact of the Chain, all the mechanics work the same, but we have some new options for our familiar. Mm -hmm. So, we have... Uh, <laughs> so, some interesting thing from the designers. We have, uh, besides the previous four, which were Imp, uh, Pseudo Dragon, uh, Quasit, and Sprite. Are they included have, here? They are, yes. Okay. So, we, we have those four plus... The Skeleton, Venomous Snake, Slad, ta uh, slad Tadpole, say that ten times fast, Yeah, uh, and a new creature, the Sphinx of Wonder. Hmm. So that's a brand new creature, I'll get to that in just a second. Now, uh, the Venomous Snake, if you keen-eyed viewers will note that the Venomous Snake was actually part of the old regular Find Familiar spell. It has been removed from the base Find Familiar spell, apparently because the designers thought it was too strong. <laughs> um i've when, never seen anyone choose that as a familiar no no I, it's bite did more damage than most other familiars but familiars can't attack yeah so now that being said in the new five familiar spell familiars can attack oh so maybe that's why yeah but yeah. it's still don't take the snake you, it's not nowhere near as good um the slad the slad tad bowl notably is also horribly weak uh do not take it unless you're like hard into role play for some reason you need a slot what, what, what does it do uh i will have to find that hold on i can tell you because i have an actual copy of the book now so give me just a second i have to scroll all the way to the bottom of it but aside from the slot tad bowl, while i get to that all right the skeleton is kind of interesting right because it is a humanoid sized and shaped creature yes you could theoretically wear armor use magic weapons use magic items things like that though its stats alone are pretty subpar compared to the other ones uh let me see here slod tadpole uh well no that's spider that is here it is uh it has an ac of 12 hp of 7 it has a burrow speed that's interesting Okay. I'll admit that uh, it is resistant to acid, cold, fire, lightning, and thunder damage. It has magic resistance, so it has advantage on saving throws against spells. Uh, though its saving throws aren't that good, so that's not going to help it much. And it has a bite with a plus four to hit and deals five piercing damage. Oh, that's, that's all. It. No all special right. abilities. You're Reminder: not, right. The imp can be invisible and fly, and has a poisonous sting. Right. Yeah. No, we're not, we're not competing with that. I was hoping um, to, like, impregnate people or, you know, with slot cool, eggs. Right? Kind of like an alien thing? Yeah, that's what slot do. I mean, uh, yeah, if uh, I recall uh, from uh, 3.5 slot. They still do that. One yeah. of them does, at least. They have different, there's different types of slot. I know, I'm pretty sure one of them does that, at least. <sighs> um, but we do have a new creature, the Sphinx of Wonder, which actually is comparable to the original four. So let's talk about that one. All right. Uh, we've got an AC of 13, HP of 24. It has a speed of 20 feet, but a fly speed of 40 feet. So that's good. That is comparable to the imp. Um, it's really good at a couple of skills. It has a plus four to arcana, religion, and a plus five to stealth. So it'll be pretty stealthy with the rest of the party. It is resistant to necrotic, psychic, and radiant damage. It has uh, dark vision at 60 feet. It speaks celestial and common. It has magic resistance. And it has a rend attack that deals five slashing damage plus 
uh, 2d6 radiant damage. Wow. And it has a, a special ability as a reaction that it can use twice per day called Burst of Ingenuity. Uh, the And it triggers whenever the Sphinx or another creature within 30 feet of it makes an ability check or a saving throw. And it can add two to that roll. Cool. So I think it's a very good option. Yeah. Um, it doesn't well, have any how, visibility or anything. But How big is it? Uh, it is a tiny creature. Oh, all right. Yeah, no, I, I know that say Sphinx, you think big, but no, yeah, right, right. It's very small. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a fantastic option. Sure, and yeah. it's um, it's a celestial, so it fits into the warlocks that maybe want to play more of a person that's more clearly aligned with the good. Um, yeah. So yeah, I I think the the Sphinx of Wonder goes right up there with the imp and the pseudo dragon and all those. It's just as good as all those, and I think it's a very viable choice. So that's wonderful. Sure. Um, so yeah, the um, oh, I should also mention with the imp specifically, and I think the closet this applies to as well. Uh, they have lost their non magical weapon resistances. Okay. So you know how all devils and demons had you know resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing. Right. So the imps and the closet and the closet were part of that, so they don't have that anymore. That also seems to be in the case of every monster. At least every monster that is in the player's handbook. Uh, obviously, we don't have the full monster manual yet, yeah. but no creature in the player's handbook has those resistances anymore. So they seem to be gone. All right. Well, so, too bad. Uh, too, too bad for the yeah, Great for all, basically every other walk of life. So <laughs> um, that's Fact of the Chain. Like I said, Skeleton might have some utility. Sphinx of Wonder is a clear winner. Probably ignore the rest. Um, now, Pact of the Blade is potentially the most buffed, both both in it itself and also the things that you can put on top of it. So there is um, this now allows you, as the old Hexblade did. Remember, the Hexblade still exists. You can still play it if you'd like to, but I don't think you're going to need to anymore. Because uh, if you are attacking with your Conjured Weapon, you're able to attack and deal damage with your Charisma, which was the big selling point of the Hexblade. Mm -hmm. um, and you can have the weapon deal Radiant, Necrotic, or Psychic damage rather than its normal damage type. So this is great. It can be used to conjure any melee weapon. And it has a lot of potential build around utility. Obviously, there's going to be a big call for paladins to take a one-level dip into Warlock. There was already with the Hexblade, but mm -hmm. now you don't have to pick Hexblade. Now you can pick something else and just pick up this as your level one invocation. So that's a big deal. Um, additionally, there is a lot more incentive for Warlocks to be weapon users now. Um, I'll jump ahead a little bit, and I'll talk about some of the... Um, some of the invocations that you can stack on top of this. So there's Life Drinker. It still exists. Its level prerequisite has been lowered. It used to be a level 15 invocation. It's now level 9. The power has also decreased. Uh, it now deals only an extra d6 once per turn, whereas it used to add your Charisma modifier to all damage rolls. Okay. How, however, it lets you expend a hit die when you hit to heal. And it is nice that you have a little bit of passive healing. But yes, this is weaker. The bigger deal, though, is Devouring Blade. So this requires you to have taken Pact of the Blade and Thirsting Blade, which Thirsting Blade works the exact same as it did. It gives you an extra attack with your Pact Weapon. Devouring Blade gives you two extra attacks. Oh. So that's a total of three with your action. Uh, and it comes in at level 11, which uh, just happens to be the exact same level that fighters get their third attack. <laughs> Uh, and you're also a spellcaster with level six spells at that point. So, uh, sorry, fighters. <laughs> but this is really, really good. Sure. Yeah. I see a lot of reasons, especially with the advent of weapon mastery. Now, Warlocks don't get Weapon Mastery, and Pact of the Blade doesn't give them that either. You're going to need a multi-class if you want Weapon Mastery, or there is a feat that grants you Weapon Mastery, you know, if you'd like it. Um, but I see a lot of Warlocks 
taking uh, starting one level in fighter and then going the rest in warlock. Mm -hmm. That gives you constitution saving throw proficiency, armor proficiency, shield proficiency, and all of the weapon masteries you could want. And uh, that's basically all that Pact of the Blade is missing to be a fully functioning marshal that also has full spell casting on top of it. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty good. Um, now, obviously, we have to compare it to the Eldritch Blast build, right? Because you don't have to multi-class at all to do that. That's all built right into the ba base uh, class. So, how's the comparison? Well, obviously, Eldritch Blast has the added utility of being able to push and pull with things like Repelling Blast and Grasp of Adar. But weapons can do that too now. Really? Thanks to Weapon Mastery. There is a push Weapon Mastery that when you oh, hit, yeah, pushes right. people back 10 feet. And if you want to emulate Eldritch Blast, you can get the Heavy Crossbow, which does that. It has the push Mastery. So just take that, take Crossbow Expert as your feet to ignore the loading property, and there you go. Uh, you've you're probably dealing more damage, but I feel like the best thing that you're going to be able to do with this is actually get more of a melee build. Uh, and that's new to hear me saying, because normally I always advocate for ranged combat, right? Mm -hmm. However, in this next player's handbook, there is a lot more incentive to be melee than there is ranged That's combat. really good. I'm happy to hear that. Uh... Yeah. It is going to be very hard to make a ranged build that does equivalent damage to melee. And that I'm makes fine. a lot of sense, yes. Yeah, I I'm okay with this. So we have feats like Great Weapon Master that, no, doesn't have the minus 5 to plus 10 now, but does have the ability to add your proficiency bonus to every attack you make with your action. That can add up to a lot, especially yeah. once you're getting like a plus 4 proficiency bonus. On average, in the early levels, it's doing less damage, but it actually catches up to the old Great Weapon Master in later levels. Um... So that's really great. You can still take Polearm Master and Great Weapon Master together. That still works. Um, you don't get the big plus 10 to the butt end attack anymore. Right. But it's still a bonus action attack if you'd like it. There's a lot of build potential here if you'd like to do that. And I think this is actually both going to deal more damage than the Eldritch Blast build. And potentially have even more utility thanks to weapon masteries. I like to hear that. So, I see a lot of warlocks picking up a sword coming up. That's good. I, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of things that I like. I like that, uh, you know, warlocks have different ways to go now that are, you know, comparably powerful and interesting. Yes. Yeah. I like that, um, you know, range is an like the default choice for uh you know being more yeah. powerful you have to actually uh, think about it now right yeah and you're gonna have a lot i think it's gonna make for a lot more interesting games i agree and th this also all to say the basic eldritch blast build still works great and mm -hmm. it's still just as powerful as it always has been it's not a ton less powerful in terms of damage it lets you stay at range there's some there's some advantages to it you know you have to think about what you want for your character. Uh, let's go over some more um, invocations, though, real quick. Okay, sure. So um, I just realized a typo that I'm going to fix. I'll send you that later. Uh, uh -huh. Devil's Sight now uh, includes normal vision and dim light as well as darkness. There was kind of a funny little thing with it where previously you could see in darkness just fine, but dim light still imposed disadvantage on perception checks for you. Okay, that's... That sounds like they just fixed uh, a they did yes a typo yes yeah so uh, eldritch sphere which is the invocation that previously increased the range of your eldritch uh, blast and uh, by the way I should say this for all of the uh, cantrip no, sorry uh, invocations that used to work with eldritch blast now you actually pick a cantrip that they work with oh that's interesting so you can choose something other than you can choose something like fire blast or ray of frost if you mm -hmm. like eldritch blast is still going to be the best most of the time because it was something like agonizing blast it's still adding damage to each blast whereas with the fireball uh firebolt would only add, add damage once so i don't see you doing that very often but you can hmm. um now uh, back to eldritch sphere instead of increasing the range of eldritch blast to 300 feet it increases the range of the selected cantrip by 30 times your warlock <laughs> wow 
which will start as less than Eldritch yeah. Spheres did, but it will eventually increase to more than. Yes. Uh, we are talking about a potential increase of, uh, what's 20 times 30? <laughs> um, 600. Yeah, 600 feet. On top, this is of its in regular range, yes. to 120 feet. So, That's... and then you can take the spell sniper feet. <laughs> Which I think still doubles it, so we're talking about no, a thousand... Talking... 1,440 feet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, if that ever comes up in a game, please let us know. Yeah. I would love to hear about how you absolutely sniped a guy from a, like a quarter mile away. Yeah, you just hang out on top of a mountain and have at it. Um, moving on, uh, Ascendant Step, which is the one that gave you Levitate. Um, and I should also mention, there are none of the invocations that gave you a spell and let you force you to cast it with a Warlock slot. Those just don't exist in this book. Yeah, but, I mean... And good riddance. That mean, well, no, that means they're backwards compatible, they just haven't changed. That's true, yeah. I didn't think about it that way. Uh, but Ascendant Step is one of the good ones. It gave you Levitate, but it didn't charge you a Warlock spell slot for it. Um, but it used to be at level 9 which was too high for levitate we have fly at that point yes. now it's been moved to level 5 that's still pretty high for I mean it at is... will levitate is okay yeah I say at will levitate is probably fine for level 5 because yeah. it's not as good as flight you know right but I mean even you know the fly spell is an at will fly it's True. a constant yeah. resource um, Gaze of Two Minds, which was the invocation that allowed you That's to kind of see through somebody else's eyes. G-A-Z-E. <laughs> yes. Thank you for catching that. All right. <laughs> Not indecisive homosexual people. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, now, it used to be, and I believe Find Familiar works like this too, the features that let you see through another creature's eyes. Mm -hmm. They used to blind you and deafen you right. to your own senses. They don't do that anymore. Yeah, nice. Um, so Lessons of the First Ones is a brand new invocation. It is repeatable, you can take it as many times as you'd like, and it gives you an origin feat. Oh, all right, cool. Which I think is actually really good. I think a lot of people are going to want to pick up um, some of the origin feats. Some of them are really good, and some people are going to want more than one of them. So I think that's great. Uh, it's a wonderful option to have. Um, which site now just straight up grants true site. It had some specific wording before that didn't actually cover all illusions and stuff. Yeah. Now it just grants true sight, which is actually kind of cool. Um, sure. Those are all the major ones that I wanted to touch on. There are more changes in the changes in this, but they're all pretty minor. Uh, I can't believe they didn't update like all those ones that you know, just had a spell, but it cost you a slot. That's. I would have been fine with them just taking all those spells and moving them onto the warlock spell list. Yeah. They didn't do that either. Like polymorph, which is the one that I could kind of say, maybe take that invocation, maybe. Like, that was the only one that I could kind of sort of justify. But yeah, I, anyway. Th there was a lot they could have done with those. Instead, they just didn't. Yeah. Just, um, <clears throat> just don't let it cost a slot. Yeah. So, we're finally on to level two. Oh, wow. All right. Don't worry, the rest of the base class is going to go much faster. We get Magical Cunning. This allows us to, once per long rest, perform a one-minute ritual to regain half of our total pack slots rounded up. Okay. So for the majority of this campaign, it's going to be spend a one-minute ritual, get a pack slot back. But eventually it'll be two and three. Well, just two. You'll never get two from this. Um, but hey, that's nice. Sometimes you don't have an hour. Sometimes you've got a minute. Most times you have a minute. Um, yeah, you, you can squeeze out a minute. Yeah, so level four, as it ever, with everybody giving a feat. And then I'm just going to come straight to level nine because we're talking about full spellcasters here. They don't get a lot of actual features. We're getting invocations, subclass features, and spells in these in between levels. All right. So level nine, uh, and most of those things haven't changed, by the way. Level nine, we get a brand new feature called Contact Patron. Now you're going to hate this at first. But ho hold on for a moment. We learn the contact other plane spell. Now, ho hold on, hold on, hold on. We can cast it once per day for free to talk to our patron. 
Okay. And we automatically succeed on the saving throw of the spell. Is, is this the one that if you fail, it makes you go insane? Yes. Okay. But don't worry, that won't happen to us. Right. We're fine. I think this is, this is mostly just a ribbon flavor feature, right? But I think it's one that really needed to be in the class. To give you a legitimate, actual way to talk to your patron. I don't know. I, mean, I, I always felt like that was like a, a DM's discretion kind of thing. Like, if you... Yeah, if the patron wanted to contact you, that was like up to him and up to your DM. But uh, I don't know if I'm this otherworldly, godly being, and I've got all my little servants around the world. I don't want them having my phone number. Okay, so let's talk about that because this is interesting, and this is something I wanted to bring up with this spell in particular, with this class. The contact other plane spell, all it does is give you yes or no answers by rules as written. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say, if your patron is like that, if your patron, for example, if you're a great old one, Warlock, their patrons aren't going to sit down and have conversations with them, are they? Uh, they're, so I think for that, if you if that is your patron, you should get just vague senses of yes and vague senses of no, that sort of thing, right? Or or they can outsource the, you know, the yeah. answers. Yeah, yeah. Um, Alternatively, if you have a particularly chatty patron, like an Archfey or something, yeah. that might actually, you know, there might actually be a legitimate conversation there, right? Yeah. So I, I play it by ear. You know, the spell rules is written only gives yes or no answers. And you <clears> as a DM can still only give yes or no answers, but you can say more words than yes or no. Does that make sense? Yeah. You can so, DM, you can do whatever the hell you want. Yeah, have fun with it. You know, don't. Change it up a little bit if you want to. Do whatever feels best for the story. So, um, level 11 with Mythic Arcanum, the only change is that you may swap an Arcanum spell with another of the same level whenever you level up so you're not locked into them. Um, I believe this was actually also a change in Tasha's that you let you do this, but now it's part of the base class. Hmm. Is um, it Mythic Arcanum or Mystic Arcanum? Oh, it might have been thought... Mystic. I, I might have mistyped that. My, my mistake. I believe it's right. Mystic. Okay. Sorry, I played too much Magic right, the Gathering. Fine. The word mythic yeah. is ingrained into my brain. <laughs> um, level 19, we get an epic boon. I actually wanted to make a quick mention of this because I've been wrong about this in the past couple of videos. The epic boon is not granted by your class. At level 19, the only thing that is preventing you from taking a level, an epic boon is the level 19 prerequisite. All epic boons have a level 19 prerequisite. That means... If you, you multi-class multi yeah. in a certain way where you get a feat on level 19 and a feat on level 20, you could get two epic boons. So the way you'd do this, say you were a fighter barbarian, right? Yeah. Uh, and fighter was your main class. Yes. So we take fighter to up to level 15. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to take four barbarian levels. Okay. That gives me to level four barbarian at overall level 19. Right. I take an epic boon. I take yep. my next level in fighter. That's level 16. That's a feat. Okay. And I take an epic boon. Oh, because. Oh, all right. I see what you're saying. So, yeah, the only. An epic boon is a feat. With just the one that, of level 19. Right. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So, um, well, I know heard previous... it here first. Previously, Maybe. I might have said that uh, Epic Boons were a great incentive for being straight classed. That's a lie. <laughs> In fact, they're better if you multi-class. Yes. Um, and uh, our capstone is uh, Eldritch Master. Whenever you use your magical cunning feature to regain pack slots, you regain all slots as opposed to half. That'll be four at this level. Oh, yeah, that's something. Yeah, it's not much, but it's better than the old Warlock capstone, which I think it took 10 minutes and you didn't even get all your spell slots back. I can't remember. Um, so this, okay, the base Warlock, right, is mostly just a tuned up version of its previous self. We get a lot of improvements in the invocations and we still have the base core Eldritch Blasting Warlock that everybody loves. Still mixes with the Sorcerer super well all of that still works and is still amazing. Mm -hmm. In addition, though, 
there's other cool stuff you can do. And I love that. That's wonderful. Um, I think this is exactly what should have happened to all the classes. Keep the core there. Add more to it, though. Give you more things that you can do. Expand the horizons of the class. I feel like it's exactly what they did with the Warlock here, and I'm very happy with it. Oh, good. All right. Um, talk about subclasses? Yes. All right. So, subclasses, yes. The special note with all the subclasses, let's go over this first before we touch any of them. You'll remember that uh, previously the Warlocks did get an expanded spell list with each of their sp uh, subclasses. Yes. But they didn't actually learn the spells automatically. They were just added to the list of spells that you could learn with your spell pickups. Right. This has been thankfully changed. You get all the spells now for free. All right, that's that's pretty huge. That's great. That's wonderful. Um, this is also great because uh, whereas a class like the Sorcerer did actually get the ability to learn more spells now, we'll talk about that more when we get to the Sorcerer, but the Warlock didn't. The Warlock's still a level 19, uh, excuse me, a level 20, knows a maximum of uh, 15 spells just mm -hmm. from its base class. So this is giving you an additional 10. <laughs> That's really good. Yeah. Um. So let's go over that. We have the Arch I mean, for Not only getting additional spells, which is great, but mm -hmm. uh, you've also got the, uh, what was that called, where you can uh, replenish half your um, slots? Yes, the magic magic cutting magical. Cutting. Yeah, this is a uh, this is making warlocks a uh, a little bit more bearable caster now. Yes, I agree. Um, so the arch fey, arch fey was typically considered kind of underpowered, below average, and for the warlock, uh, not so anymore. This is amazing. I love it. <laughs> um, and it is all about teleportation, and that's a cool thing to center around. Sure. So let's talk about their spells. Uh, big highlights here include Misty Step, more on that one later, uh, Fairy Fire, Phantasmal Force, Sleep. Sleep has been changed, uh, but it's still pretty good. It's just good in a kind of a different way. Um, plant Growth uh, and Greater Invisibility are all fantastic pickups. Um, this is a great list overall, and I don't sure. have too much to complain about with it. So getting into the actual features... They have Steps of the Fey. So, you may cast Misty Step without expending a spell slot a number of times equal each day equal to your Charisma modifier. That's pretty big. Uh, and when you do so, you get a bonus effect. Now, it's notable you only get this bonus, bonus effect when you cast the spell this way. So, if you cast Misty Step normally using a spell slot, you won't get this. But you're going to be using Well, it. you're not going to do that. because exactly, I mean, yeah. This is plenty enough times to cast Misty Step. Yes. So, um, when you teleport, you or a friend within 10 feet of you may gain 10, 1d10 temporary hit points, or you can force a wisdom save on everyone who is within 5 feet of where you teleported from. On a fail, they have disadvantage to hit anyone but you for the next turn. Well, that's, and that's really interesting. Yes, because you just teleported away from them. Exactly. Yeah. So if they're melee enemies, they may not have be able to get to you, right? Yeah. So I should also note, with the new spell casting rules that we have, you're only allowed to cast one spell with a spell slot per day. This is not using a spell slot, though. Which means you can misty step and th throw a leveled spell all on the same turn. Hmm. So that's really powerful. Um, now, that's oh, wait, what, does this cost an action or anything? It's your bonus action, like Miss, bonus Miss, action? Missy Step normally does. All right, all right. So you can't do a Missy Step. All right, all right, all right. I got it. Yeah. Um, so that's that's again the third level. At sixth level, uh, we can cast Misty Step as a reaction whenever we take damage. <laughs> that's kind of cool. Yeah. Additionally, we get two new options for our steps of the fix. So these are adding the where we could either distribute temporary HP or force the disadvantage to taunt creatures. Here are two more options. All right. Uh, question. Yeah. Now, casting Misty Step as a reaction, is this using a slot or one of your steps of the Fae or what? Either. Your choice. Oh, all right. Cool. But so you could. Because this is a reaction, 
So you could cast Misty Step twice. Yes. If you wanted to. Yeah, so you can Misty Step as a bonus action, then Misty Step as your reaction after you take right. damage. Yeah, you could totally do that. Yeah. Okay, fun. Um so here are the two options that you get uh with Misty Escape. So you either become invisible after teleporting until the start of your next turn, or you attack or cast a spell, the traditional invisibility rules. Um so you become invisible, or you deal 2d10 psychic damage to all creatures within 5 feet of where you teleported from, or your destination. Huh. Uh, and they do get a wisdom save to um, negate this damage. Note, there is no damage on a successful save. This is not to have damage on a, uh, on a failed save. or successful I'm, save. I'm okay with that. This, this is quite a lot. Um, so yeah, that's just a straight up grade to your steps of the fate feature. Yeah. I'm probably going to use the invisibility a lot because that's pretty cool. I feel like the combination of the invisibility and the taunt is, you know, you, mm -hmm. if, if you're fighting like ranged characters, then the invisibility is really good. If you're fighting a bunch of melee characters, the taunt is really good. So, they, but they, you know, to be clear, they did not fix the invisibility rules. No, they did. They did. Yes. I thought we talked about that before and they hadn't. No, that is one of the things they have fixed. Yes. All right. What we didn't talk about it before. Now? Uh, if you can see a creature, if you can see an invisible creature, it does not benefit from the invisible condition. Okay. All right. So, uh, I'm feeling feeling good now. Yep. Um, and at level, uh, I believe eleven, or is it ten? It might be ten. I think it is ten. Uh, beguiling def defenses. Oh no, I think they also get this level. No, no, it is okay. Sorry. Either way. They, uh, once you get this, you are immune to the charmed condition, which is really good. Yeah. Charm can come up a lot, and flat out immunity is hard to come by. Um, we also gain a new reaction in response to taking a hit. Now, we can already cast Misty Step as a reaction to taking damage, though this is a, a reaction specifically after taking hit. So you could cast Misty Step in response to taking a fireball, for example. You couldn't right. use this. Uh, you gain resistance to all damage of the attack, and your attacker must make a wisdom save or take psychic damage equal to the damage you took. Now, huh. again, note they take no damage on a successful save. And you get one use of this per day, and you can use it again by expending a pack slot. I don't think that's worth it, but I do like the one for use. Huh. Depends on how much damage you took. <laughs> that's true, actually. Yeah. yeah. Now, note you are having the damage. So then they're taking the half damage as well. Right. And it is a saving throw, and it is a wisdom save. So if they're particularly good at those, it may not land. There's but, you know, there's going to be some times when like they're down to their last few hit points, but if they if they land one more blow on you, you're going to die. Yeah, yeah, Taken it's down. it's it's a really cool feature. I like it, yeah. and um, it's a good thing to add on to a defensive feature, right? We always complain about defensive features kind of being boring. That's not boring. No, none of this is. Um, then uh, their capstone bewitching magic now. Whenever you cast an illusion or enchantment spell, you may also cast Misty Step without expending a spell slot as part of the same action used to cast the initial spell. This is nuts. It's really good, right? Yeah. Now, no, that's not using up your bonus action or anything. You use an action to throw a fireball or something. You Misty Step with that action. And this is this is not using up your uh, steps of the Fey either, right? No, it's not using <laughs> up anything. You can just do this. As long as you're casting an illusion or an enchantment spell, you can use this. So I guess Firewall was a bad example. But yeah. you know what I mean. <laughs> right. So, and you can also add uh, any of these features that we talked about earlier, I think. I might actually have to talk about No, that. no, because that's part be of Steps that. of the yeah. Fey. And those, okay, so you, can't you have do a limited that. number of those. You can't do that. Right. But you do get a free Misty step. Like, this is, if you wanted to play the Nightcrawler character, you know, the guy that's just teleporting around the battlefield everywhere, Yeah, this is how you do it. This is really good. I mean, if you grab, uh, what's that uh, illusion Fate cantrip? Touch. Oh, what? well, I was going to say Fate Touch to get another free use of Misty Step. <laughs> oh, no. No, you got Misty. No, I mean, like I said, uh, what's the, uh, what's the uh, right. what, silent image? Uh, yeah, there's Silent Image, there's Minor Illusion. Which one's the, the cantrip? Minor Illusion. All right, Minor Illusion. I mean, that's an illusion spell. 
Now you've just got free Misty Step. I'm going to check real quick to make sure that it is not with you have to cast it with a spell slot. But I believe, yeah, you're right. So, yeah, it's really good, right? Yeah. Um, I think this is one of the better ones in the book and maybe one of the better ones overall now. Um, okay, you do have to use a spell slot. I'm sorry. Ah, all right, all right. Well, it's still good. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, you, you've got more, of, you've already got unlimited misty steps. Yes. Let's let's be real. And there are plenty of good uh, illusion and enchantment spells. Oh yeah, that warlocks have access to. So no, this is probably this. I will say, this subclass might be one of the biggest glow ups in this entire book. Like we went from a subclass that basically nobody picked to you're gonna have a hard time convincing me not to pick this one. Yeah, this is a good one. Um. Then we move on to the Celestial. Uh, as we said, they are now getting their full spell list where they didn't before. So mm -hmm. we're uh, adding spells like Aid, Revivify, Wall of Fire, Summon Celestial. Those are all pretty good. This is not as good of a list as the Archfey, but I still like it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's... I don't have too much more to talk about with the <laughs> Celestial. Their Healing Light feature, which gave them a bonus pool of D8s or D6s to heal people unchanged radiant soul the one that lets them add damage to fire and radiant spells unchanged uh and celestial resilience uh gives you is a feature that uh when you finish a short rest you gave yourself temporary hp and you gave everybody else a little bit less temporary hp it's a good feature uh it gives this you the same amount of temporary hp uh and your friends but now you can gain and distribute them whenever you use your magical cunning feature as well as whenever you finish a rest. Okay. So you'll get to distribute them more. Nice. Uh, and the Searing Vengeance, it used to be one of those features that it, it, it worked kind of weirdly because it said whenever you make a death saving throw, you can spring back up with hit points and deal damage to everybody around you. It was one of those features, right? Right, right. Now you can actually use it on an ally when they make a death saving throw. Oh. I actually really like that. That's a good feature. Um, because... Yeah, you don't have to like die. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't have to die. You can you trust that the stupid barbarian will, yeah. and you know bring him back up, and that's cool. That being said, that's all the changes for the celestial. Yeah, that's uh, not super exciting. No, the celestial was average, probably in terms of the warlock subclasses, maybe on the below average side. I would have liked to see some more buffs and more things to actively do, uh, especially for the one Warlock subclass in this book that is clearly supposed to be for good aligned people. Mm -hmm. And you can be a good aligned fiend warlock, don't get me wrong, but it's clear that this is supposed to be the one. I think it's honestly the weakest in the book because it just didn't get the globs that the other ones did. Well, oh, I mean... How was it before? Not fantastic. Right. <laughs> so, you know. Um, the Fiend. Let's talk about it. Sure. Uh, this is one that I rated a lot higher than you guys did. But uh, it now gets its spells. So we're talking about spells like Suggestion, Fireball, and Wall of Fire. That's pretty good. Sure, um, yeah. I could talk about others, but you're all here for Fireball. So <laughs> I should stop there. Um, Dark One's Blessing, which gave you temporary HP whenever you kill something, now also gives you the temporary HP whenever a creature within 10 feet of you drops to zero hit points. All right, I like that. So that's really good because if somebody else kills the enemy, and then this also incentivizes you to be a melee warlock. So you that's, up and, and we already have other incentives to do that exactly. as well. I think Fiend might be a go to pick for a lot of melee warlocks now that Hexblade isn't a mm -hmm. mandatory selection. Um, they get Dark One's Own Luck. It works the same as it did, giving you a D10 to add to a saving throw, I think any D20 roll. Um, but it now, instead of giving you one use per short rest, it gives you Charisma Mod uses per long rest, which is probably going to average out to more. Yeah. And it also means that you can use it multiple times between short rests. So if you have this really bad saving throw that hits you and you want to succeed it, and then another really bad saving throw that hits you and you want to succeed on it, you can do that now. So I, I think it's a overall a big buff to the feature. Okay. Um, Fiendish Resilience 
This is the feature that let you select a damage type and you're resistant to that damage. Um, the only change here is that you can't select force as your damage resistance, whatever. Uh, yeah. And silvered weapons no longer bypass your resistance. So this was kind of a little niche feature. It was a flavor thing for right. devils that silvered weapons would bypass yeah. their resistances. Um, and since you were taking your power from the devil, you also inherited that weakness. That is not the case anymore, as not even devils have this line of text anymore. So it wouldn't make sense for you to. All right. Well. And the last one, which I will personally say is the most disappointing change in the entire book. And this is completely biased. It's not actually, but it's the one I'm the most upset about. It's Hurl Through Hell, which used to be one of the coolest capstone features in the entire game. No <laughs> save. You hit somebody, you, you, you send them to hell. Yeah, that was nuts. I remember that. So now it requires them to fail a charisma save. And to be fair, charisma is probably the best stat to, to hit. Right. I'll give it that. But if it does activate, it only deals 8d10 damage rather than 10d10. Um, so it's a small damage nerf. But you can use it again by expending a pack slot. Is that use useful because you're spending a 5th level slot? Maybe. Right? If it's a creature that you are pretty certain is going to fail the charisma save, then you might be able to tell that. You might be able to predict that. Yeah. Especially if they failed one already. Maybe? I mean, how would you rate a fifth level spell that completely knocked a creature out of the fight for a turn and dealt eight D ten damage to them? And it did not it didn't have any other effects? I thought it like messed with their head or something. No, um well it does psychic damage, that's the messing with their oh, head. What, all right, yeah. Yeah. Um but, I mean, it completely takes them for out yeah. of the fight for an entire round. That's pretty big. That would be kind of an average 5th level spell, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's wildly bothering to me because in the actual design videos, they said it was a mistake that Hurl Through Hell didn't require a saving throw, which was just insulting to me. Like... <laughs> No, no, that's the reason the feature is good. That's the reason it's one of the best capstone features in the game. Let it work like that. I even told them. I filled out the survey. Big oh, bold wow. letters. Don't take, take don't add a saving throw to hurl through hell. And they did it anyway. So, you know. Yeah, well. Um, but outside of that, and most people aren't reaching the capstone anyway, and if you are, only for a few levels. This is still good. It this is straight buffs to all of the features. Um, it's not big buffs, but specifically, I think for a blade warlock, that those extra constantly refreshing temporary hit points are going to be a great boon to your your survivability, and that alone might be reason enough to take this subclass. Yeah, uh, I mean, I see the play pattern in my head, so and it seems like it could be a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. Now let's talk about the great old one, because who boy the great old one. It used to suck. <laughs> and that was a real shame, right? Yeah, because that's the, the quintessential warlock patron. Yeah. Or oh, that and the, the fiend, I guess. The, like, the, the person who serves Cthulhu right. should have a bit more oomph to him, I think. So, uh, let's first talk about their spells, because like all the other ones, they get them for free. Um, detect Thoughts, Hideous Laughter, Hunger of Hadar, which we talked about was buffed. Uh, and some an aberration are all great picks. Um, but I will note most of this list is already warlock spells, mm -hmm. but it's still nice to be able to free up your choices to select other things with your regular yeah. spell selections. So that's nice. I mean, Hunger of Adar, Hideous Laughter, Summon Aberration, those are probably spells that I would have picked up. So it's nice to get them for free. Um, Awakened Mind, which gives them telepathy. Uh, you now have to actually set up a line of communication between you and your target. It takes things a bonus action to set up. Um, it doesn't really change how you're going to use a feature in actual play, but it is going to come up later for a feature. Mm -hmm. um, and you do need to share a language for them to speak back to you. Though you don't need to share a language for you to talk to them, though they won't understand you. It's... it's a, hey! <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, they also get psychic spells at third level. Uh, at third level, you can change the damage type of any of your warlock spells to psychic damage. 
Uh, also, illusion and enchantment spells don't require verbal or somatic components. So you get a, basically a free subtle spell on any illusion or enchantment spell as long as they don't have a material component. Yeah. And a lot of spells do, right? But you might be able to conceal that some way, especially if you're using a spell focused. If your spell focus is, you know, a little ring on your hand, you can just right. put your hand in your pocket and maybe you can get away with it, right? Um, so that's cool. They also get at sixth level clairvoyant combatant, which just sounds neat and rolls off the tongue nicely. Uh, when you form a tele telepathic bond using your awakened mind feature, you can force the target to make a wisdom saving throw. If they fail, they have disadvantage to hit you, and you have advantage to hit them. You get one use, and you can expend a spell slot to use it again. That's kind of interesting, right? Because this is taking a utility out of combat feature and turning it into a combat feature. Yeah. I, I like that play. I like that design space, right? Yeah, that's, that's cool. So, exactly how useful is it? Well, it's a wisdom save. They gotta fail a wisdom save first off. But if you hit, you have advantage on all of your attacks. They have disadvantage on attacks against you. And it, I, get, I get the flavor. You're mind reading them, so you're literally mm -hmm. predicting their movements and stuff. It, it's, it, it's cool flavor. I like it. Yeah. Exactly how good it is with only one use of it per day. Because I don't really know if it's worth spending spell slots on. I'm not no, sure. No, I don't think so. Because, I mean, you're, it's essentially like you're, you're casting blindness on them. Yeah, it is very similar to that, isn't it? So, um, it doesn't require your concentration or anything, so that's nice, yeah. although neither does the blindness spell. Um, but I, it is cool, and I like it, and I like the flavor of it. The real power of this subclass is coming in at level 10, and that's with Eldritch Hex. So, you always have the Hex spell prepared, and when you cast yeah. Hex and choose an ability for the target to have disadvantage to their checks for. So, you know, normally when you cast Hex, you can do something like Strength, and they have disadvantage on Strength checks. Right. You know how everybody always mistook it for a disadvantage on Strength saving throws, right? No, but... Well, I'm a lot of people do. Okay. But now it actually does that. Oh, good. So, the Great Old One at level 10, their Hex actually imposes disadvantage on saving throws as well as ability checks for the chosen ability score. That's a big deal. That's mm. a really big deal. It is very hard, especially that we've seen a removal of even some of the ways in this new book, to impose a disadvantage on saving throws. There's a Sorcerer's Heightened spell, and that's about it. <laughs> um, This is really, really cool. Now, Hex still requires concentration. So you're probably actually setting up another caster for this. I think this subclass works best in a party with another sorcerer or another wizard because there you can say i'm going to give this guy disadvantage on his wisdom saves hit him with the feeble mind or something right or i mean or yourself you hit him with a disadvantage on wisdom saves and then use your clairvoyant combat and... that's true yeah you could do that um and this actually i believe because normally i would never be casting hex at 10th level it's just not worth it. You have your better things that you're spending a fifth level spell slot on Hex. That being said, I kind of think this is worth it, actually. I think this is worth a fifth level spell slot. That's how big of a glow up for the for the spell it is. Um, I think, too, because the duration on Hex this is something we don't really talk about with Hex too much because I don't cast it at higher levels. But if you can hold concentration on it, upcasting it actually increases its duration. Potentially up to like 24 hours. Or I think it might, might have it eight hours. But either way, it's enough to have it cover the whole sure. day. Yeah. So, you know, that could be your whole day is just going around giving people disadvantage on their saving throws. Yeah, that, that could be nuts. So, Especially if you've, uh, if you've got your own concentration protected well. Yeah, and you definitely make sure you have that. I recommend that for all casters. And it's even easier to do now because Warcaster will give you a plus one to your charisma as well. Woohoo. Um, so I think Eldritch Hex is the big cornerstone of this subclass I think it's really really good I think the subclasses might be a little bit underperforming before you get there but once you hit that that is amazing yeah it's uh, uh, kind of thematically fitting yeah they also get at level 10 Thought Shield this is just a passive defensive feature this used to be the only thing they got at level 10 um <laughs> We have resistance to psychic damage, and whenever we take psychic damage, 
the dealer of that damage takes the same amount of psychic damage. Nice. Not going to come up super often, but we have a real feature at level 10. Who cares, right? Yeah. And their capstone create thrall, which used to not create a thrall at all. Do you remember? I do remember that, yes. Charmed a humanoid? Yeah. Yes. Um, now it actually does create a thrall. It modifies your castings of summon aberration. Well, that's so, an interesting way to take it. Yeah, the spell no longer requires concentration for you. Ooh. And uh, the aberration has extra temporary HP, and it can benefit from the extra damage of your hex spell once per turn. Now, like I said, you probably actually are uh, even at this level to impose those disadvantages on the saving throws. And since this summon aberration doesn't require concentration, you can layer it on top, and that'll be really, really good. Yeah, or have, uh, I guess you could have multiple aberrations going. I think so. Let me double check that. Hold on. You always bring up stuff I didn't think about. Let's see. Great old one. Create Thrall. When you cast Summon Aberration, you can modify it so it doesn't require concentration. Oh, I didn't mention this in the written review. Oh. But it uh, it uh the duration becomes one minute for that casting oh, rather right. than an hour. Well, still, if, that's, if, you that's need still if you still need multiple aberrations to, to swing the tide of a fight, yeah, I mean, one minute there's... good. Nope, there's no restriction on how many aberrations you can have. <laughs> And how many times you can do that. So yes, you mm -hmm. can on turn one, cast Summon Aberration. On turn two, cast Summon On turn three, cast Summon Aberration. On turn four, cast Summon Aberration. Use all four of your spell slots. Yeah. <laughs> like Because you will have that many at this point. Just have a blast. And you can just... That's really creating some thralls there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I think that... Obviously, this is a massive improvement over the old great old one. Yes. I do think that it's only okay until you reach level 10, and then it's really good. <laughs> um, and I'm fine with that. Having a big power spike at that level, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, and I think, finally, people, all the people that wanted to play this subclass, because it has such great flavor, right? Yeah. It, it is the quintessential warlock that everybody thinks about. Well, I, I mean, they kind of cover that with Fathomless. Yeah, that was interesting too. And Fathomless still exists. You can still play that, by yeah. the way. Um, and I will also say the old Warlock subclasses don't have written in them that they automatically get their spell lists, right? And there's nothing in this book saying that the old ones do. Please at your table, just homebrew it so that they do. <laughs> like, there's nothing broken in those that is going to be awful if you let your Warlock automatically learn it. Just yeah. let them have them. And what what specifically does it say? Like, does it say in each of these classes they automatically get them? Well, in or... each of the subclasses, it says you get these spells, and they don't count against the number of spells. No, all right. So it doesn't say that in the generic warlock description. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. 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 Let, let, let it go. Do it. Yeah. Uh, just let let people have fun. Right. Um. So I will say that the warlock, as an overall comes out of this book with some great quality of life improvements, some really revamped and amazing subclasses, and a lot of great and interesting new play patterns. I see a lot of blade locks coming in the next couple of years. Um, I might even have to make a build for that myself. We'll see if I can come up with something interesting for it. Um, getting a third attack at level 11 is a huge boon. That's normally yeah, reserved for fighters. Um, we're, we're in early days with these revised subclasses, so... Uh... You want to do some uh, some builds, then um, yeah, this this will be stuff nobody's seen before. Yeah, um, there is a lot of interesting stuff. So I'll, I'll very briefly cover this. I'm pretty much done with talking about the warlock, but some early stuff that I've seen because we have had some people attempt to make builds and right. things like that. We're in sort of the primordial stages of this whole thing. Dual building is coming out looking very good, actually. Uh which is, you know, a, a fantastic thing to hear after the last 10 years. <laughs> Dual wielding looks amazing. Uh, uh, there is a prominent uh, YouTube channel, D4 Deep Dive, uh, that also just exclusively does builds. That's all he does. Uh, did a dex-based dual wielding paladin. Oh. Which just wouldn't have worked <laughs> at all in the old rules. And it's sweet. 
So I'm definitely going to be looking for cool stuff like that to build. I hate that he stole that idea first. I say stole. He just put the video up first. <laughs> but that's totally something that I would have tried to do. So I'm a little mad, but it's fine. <laughs> that is his whole shtick as he makes wild builds. Um, so yeah, look forward to that. I have, I like I said, I have a copy of the player's handbook and I am looking over it. I'm reading through it every day. And if anybody in the comments has questions about literally anything in the book, please ask. I would love to answer them. I want to get as much information out there as possible, especially before the book releases. So you know if you actually want to buy it or not. All right. Well, thank you for that. And uh, thank you for the uh, rundown on the new Warlock. Uh, that was the 2024 Warlock. Um, let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you, Cameron, for being here. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, like, subscribe. We'll, we'll see you next time. Goodbye.